Okay, Philippians chapter 2. You might recall last week we looked at the little outline of Warren Wiersbe. Chapter 1 is the single mind. And the idea of that chapter was uh, we're only here to bring God glory, whether in death or life. We want to magnify Christ. And so Christ is in the heavenly places. I want to bring him into every situation. And so that is the to further the gospel. And in so doing, uh, Paul chose to rejoice in his situations. Even though he was a prisoner, there were things he set his mind on. And we also um, took that uh, take-home thought last week that rejoicing is a choice. Chapter 2 of that outline is the servant mind. Chapter 3 is the spiritual mind. And chapter 4 is the secure mind. So tonight we'll be looking at chapter two, the servant mind. Verse one, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded and having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Now, in the Greek, this reads more like this, therefore, since there is consolation in Christ, and since comfort of love, and since fellowship of spirit, and since affection and mercy, fulfill my joy in being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. It wasn't an if. The idea is really a, a since there is. He's making a case for them to be like-minded, having the same love, being one accord and one mind. Uh, there's nothing that discourages elders more or full-time worker than those that they feel responsible for not getting along. And Paul, if Paul knew that the saints at Philippi were living um, in harmony, looking after each other's needs, then he would be refreshed. He would be encouraged. And that's the idea of, of um, verses 1 and 2. He gives us a, a three-step process for having this servant mind in verses three and four. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So he's saying, don't, don't lift yourself up. Don't be lifted up in conceit or pride. Uh, vanity. He said, instead, take the low position. So don't lift yourself up, take the low position, and then lift other, others' interests up above your own interest. So don't puff up yourself, take the low place, esteem others' interest uh, better than your own. In uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.11, Paul exhorts the busybody. A busybody is someone who inserts their interests in your interests. And that, that's very devastating in any um, body of believers. But to have the mind of Christ is a selfless mind. It doesn't esteem yourself or your interests above others. In other words, you you're just want to serve. It's You have no mindfulness of your own interests. You just want to see others uh, excel, do well, and honor the Lord. And so he's going to give four examples of, of, of having the mind of Christ in this chapter, to have this lowly mind. He says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, the only way that we can have the same mind is to have the mind of Christ. Believers naturally think differently. We have different backgrounds. We have different social um, surroundings, and the only way that we can think the same is to have the same mind, and that's Christ's mind. And so that's what Paul is exhorting the believers to do, is have the mind of Christ, and then we'll be in unity, same love, one accord, as he mentions in verse 2. So four examples of this lowly mind in chapter 4, we have Christ first, and that's in verses 5 through 11. And then Paul will briefly mention himself for a couple verses. In verse 17 
in 18. And then he talks about Timothy in 19 through 24. And then there's Epaphroditus um, as the final example of the slowly mind. <clears throat> when I read these verses in Philippians 2, it's like we're entering in on holy ground. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, it's a present tense verb. So as God, he is in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The NAS renders that did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And then that's contrasted the form of God or his deity being deity in verse six is contrasted to another form in verse seven, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Uh, Romans eight, three renders the same Greek word translated likeness in verse seven as resemblance. And so that's the idea. When you looked at Christ, he looked like a man because he, he was a man. He wasn't the same kind of man as Adam. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he came in the resemblance of a man. Made himself of no reputation. The verb made with no reputation is the Greek uh, word kinos. And the idea is that he completely, he chose not the quality of being God. He did not put a premium upon that as something to hang on to, but rather set that aside. It is glory and all things associated with being the son of God in order to become a lowly servant. Being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and came obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So this is the reason the Lord came. We had a uh, problem that could only be fixed by the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so for obedience to the Father, for the love uh, for us, he came and didn't think it uh, being equal with God, being God, something to... Uh, hold on to. He set aside his glory. We read in John chapter 17, he prayed that the Father might give him the glory that he once had, the outshining essence of who he is. Now, as we look at the Gospels, we can see his moral glory on each of the page, the aroma of God in the flesh, the way he behaved. Um, his essential glory did not change, but the outshining of that was veiled in flesh. And then Hebrews tells us that he earned a glory uh, through finishing the work of the cross. And that's what Paul gets into in verses 9 through 11, that he's got a name now higher than any name. He's Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and all shall bow to him. Uh, I wanted to spend just a little time <clears throat> on thinking about uh, verse 6. Uh, one of the heresies that are, is out there is the kenosis theory, and it uses the, the verb form of emptying or being without form um, to say that Christ somehow emptied his deity, became less than God in order to become a man. And there's basically, if you think of a four-legged stool, there's four um, tenets corollaries to the kenosis theory. Uh, the first one is that Christ had no divine attributes when he became a servant. Um, but clearly verse six is a present tense for being in the form of God. He still was God when he became a servant. And that agrees with Colossians 2.19 um, when we're talking about in him was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Christ is not some diminished deity added to human personality. Um, he is the God man. He's fully God and he's fully man. Um, one of the foundational laws of, of ontological study um, 
which is just the study of life and how things uh, are, things come to be, um, is existential causality. And that just means that if you are subject to cause and effect, you're a dependent being. Well, God is a superior being. He's not subject to cause and effect. Malachi tells us that God changes not in chapter three. Um, the Lord Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. So if God could somehow change who he is, his essence, then he wouldn't be God. He would be dependent on something else. But God doesn't change. He's eternal. He's immutable. Um, he's all-knowing. The idea that uh, Christ became less than God is the heresy of the Kenosis theory. In, some, in other words, he gave up his attributes as God to become a man. Well, Lord Jesus shows in his miracles. He shows it in the way that he knew people's thoughts. Um, that he is, he was still God, uh, just in human form. So he's not um, diminished deity, added personality. Sometimes people have difficulty with omnipresence. Well, the Lord was still omnipresence. Colossians 1 tells us that um, the Lord, even on the cross, was keeping all things in consistence. Only God could do that. Um, he was fully God, fully man. Omnipresence um, in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, for example, we have this vision, um, description of the vision, um, visage of the God the Father, all these different colored lights that are outshining from the throne. And then a hand materializes with the scroll in it. That's the father. Uh, we have the seven flames of fire before the throne, symbolizing the Holy Spirit. And then we have the lamb, which had been slain, who walks up and takes the scroll out of the hand of the father. Well, there you have the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And there's visible manifestations in one place of each of them. Does that mean that they're not omnipresent? And the answer is no, they're each omnipresent, but yet they're being represented in a certain place so that um, his presence can be known to those who are there. Now, the Lord will always be a man. There's a man in the glory right now, but he's still omnipresent. The second uh, leg to the stool is Christ is a human just like us. Well, there's actually a difference between uh, Christ's humanity and our humanity. We read in Ecclesiastes 7 29, for example, that Adam was created innocent. He had a, a capacity to sin. He had a capacity to choose wrong. He was created innocent humanity. But that's not what we read in Luke 1 35 about the Lord Jesus. When Gabriel is talking to Mary, he says, the holy thing that's within you is going to be conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Christ was holy humanity. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, and verse 15, when it talks about him being our high priest, he was tested uh, in all ways that we are, yet not in sin or sin apart, is literally how it reads in the Greek. In other words, we have a nature within us that causes us to sin. And there's also things that exert upon us in the world that cause us to sin. Um, but Christ doesn't have a nature, a fallen nature inherited from Adam that would cause him to sin. Uh, he could look upon a beautiful woman and not have a lustful thought where uh, a man today could easily have a lustful thought. But the Lord would never have a lustful thought. He didn't have that kind of nature within him. He would never lust for anything outside the will of God. So Christ was a human just like us. If you think about how the first human came into the world, God scooped up some dirt and he breathed a spirit into Adam. And he, he stood up. He was a living soul. The second person, the second human on the earth was his wife. Uh, God took a chunk of Adam's side and he created the woman and brought her to Adam and she became his wife. 
The third person that came on the earth was Cain, and that came through procreation. Well, the Lord was came to the earth in the a fourth way, and that was through the Immaculate Conception. All four are human, but they entered the earth in different ways. So Christ had no divine attributes when he became a servant. That's the first point of heresy in the kenosis theory. The second is Christ is human just like us. The third is Christ was the exact counterpart of the first Adam. In other words, the first Adam blew it, so God sent another Adam just like the first Adam, and he chose to do what's right. But as I already said, Ecclesiastes 7 9, uh, Adam was remade innocent. He had the capacity to choose the wrong. And the Lord was holy humanity. So when Adam was made innocent humanity and he sinned, he became condemned humanity. And when we believe the gospel message or the truth that God reveals in any dispensation of time, then we become redeemed humanity by the blood of Christ, justified in him, and we wait to be glorified humanity. But with the Lord Jesus, he was holy humanity, and he became glorified humanity, and that was his path to glorification. So the Lord was not a second counterpart to the first Adam. He was the last Adam. There would be no other Adam. God sent him, and he knew that he would fulfill uh, everything that he'd ask him to do. And the fourth thing is Christ is tempted just as we are. Um, it's actually, I think I'll look at this, flip over to Hebrews. I mentioned this earlier, but I think it's worth reading. Hebrews chapter 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was at all points tempted or tested as we are yet without sin. Notice we are yet is all italicized. It's not actually in the Greek. What it's saying is he was tested yet sin apart or without sin, sin apart, not in sin. And so he can relate um, to enduring the contradiction of sinners. He can relate to living on a sin-cursed earth. He can relate to being rejected, to, to be treated uh, unjustly. He can relate to being betrayed for doing what's right. He can... Um, relate to giving his life for another wrong. So these are the kinds of things that we can get consolation for from Christ at the throne of grace. But it would be absolutely, it would be blasphemous to his name to go before him and say, well, Lord, uh, I saw that lovely lady in the red dress today and I lusted after her, but you've been tested in all ways and you can give sympathy for these things. And so I know you understand. Well, that's demeaning to his character. He's not tested in sin. Uh, he was tested for 33 plus years and proved that there was no sin in him. He knew no sin. He did no sin. There was no sin in him. Uh, if you were building a bridge across a uh, interstate before anybody would go across that bridge you do a the purpose of the stress test is not to break the bridge the taxpayers would be in revolt but to test to prove the bridge is good well in the lord jesus case you could have put a gazillion tons on the bridge and it would never break uh, same can't be said for us so let's be careful when we're in our prayers, not lowering Christ in his purity into fallen humanity or a corrupt thinking that we inherited from Adam. Uh, we, we get no consolation in sin from the Lord. Uh, he can sympathize with the consequences of our sin, but we can't get any sympathy from him. The word of God is like a, a sword that thrusts us through on those things. That's what we want. It's the word of God to run us through and have the right output. But on things which the Lord can identify with, we can go to him before the throne of grace and receive uh, help in time of need. 
Well, to the extent that Christ was humbled, he was highly exalted. Verse 9, therefore God, back in Philippians 2 now, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So those of us who have bowed the knee to the Lord as Savior and received salvation, we gladly bow the knee and confess that he's Lord. And all the redeemed through time will do the same thing. At the great white throne judgment, the wicked souls will be resurrected out of Hades and they'll stand before the Lord. The books are opened. It's a judgment of works. Nobody can earn heaven by works and their deeds will condemn them. And every knee, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What I like about verse 11 is the verb confesses in the middle voice, which means the subject is doing the action, but the subject's doing the action on its own behalf. Passive voice would mean God would force them to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but the tense is middle. And that's an incredible thought that when the worst characters in human history, Hitler, Mao, you, I mean, the list is long, stand before Jesus Christ in all of his glory, they will willingly bow the knee before him and say, yes, he is Lord. How, how outstanding must be the glory of our Savior that even the wicked will acknowledge who he is. So Paul leaves this high holy ground then, and he steps into the plane of application. He says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He doesn't say work for your salvation. That's only in Christ. But he says work out your salvation. In other words, your day-to-day -day life, how are you going to live for the Christ, for the Lord Jesus Christ needs to be worked out. Now, obviously, when the Word of God says do something, we're disobedient not to do it. And if the Word of God says don't do something, we're disobedient if we do it. So he's not talking about what the Word of God says is uh, right and wrong. He's really talking about what's wise and what's foolish. I actually see in the Gospels that the Lord spent more time talking about what was wise and foolish than right and wrong. The, the right and wrong of things was already declared by God's word. And so it's wise to build your house upon the rock, the foundational truths of Christ. It's foolish to build a, a house on the sands of humanism that will crumble away. And so... Working out your salvation means we look at the lessons learned from other individuals in scripture, the nation of Israel, what they did right, what they did wrong, how they paid the consequences for what they did wrong. We look at the warnings, we look at the guidelines in scripture, and then we go before the Lord with a spirit of fear and trembling before a holy God, and we want to do what will please him. So that means following things like uh, there's a lot of these in 1 Corinthians 6, 8, 9, 1 Corinthians 10, Romans 14. Uh, could it be habit forming? Well, then don't do it. Uh, will it benefit my spiritual growth? Will it benefit other spiritual growth? Will it make for peace? Will it glorify God? Um, will it stumble a weaker brother in his faith? Will it stumble the gospel? So these are questions we can ask to work out our salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord. Uh, sometimes we don't get it right. And when we think we have liberty to do something and we do it, we feel bad afterwards. Well, we just tell the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I won't do that again. I've learned from that. Romans 14, 23 says, well, whatsoever is not of faith is a sin. So we really need to be settled in our mind as we work out our liberty before the Lord, how to live for him. There are certain areas we can't judge each other. Um, and there are certain areas that may be okay for one believer to do, but another believer can't. And uh, Paul spends a whole chapter on this in Romans 14, talking about that's not fight over such things and devour each other, 
Uh, the Lord is a judge, and he's the one who will set all things right. He goes on and says, um, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. We're only here to bring him pleasure. And then he says, do all things without complaining or disputing. Uh, the word there is arguing. And if we're really complaining as we're serving the Lord, is it really service? I don't think so. That's not the, the lowly mind of Christ. And so uh, this is a convicting verse that whatever we do, we shouldn't be complaining and arguing uh, along the way, but just serving the Lord. <clears throat> he says that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights of the world. Verse 15 is, is picturist, picturistic of where we are today. Uh, we live in a very dark world. It's a crooked and perverse generation. And yet that dark backdrop gives believers the opportunity to shine even brighter as lights for the, for the Lord. And so Paul's wish was that they would be blameless and harmless. Um, they would be without fault. They'd be living for the Lord. Uh, they wouldn't be given over to carnality, but they'd be in unity of one mind as serving the Lord together. He says, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. And that's our um, word again of kinos, which means to, to empty. Um, <clears throat> here is supplied in uh, vain, to have no value. It's um, what we saw again back in verse 6. The day of Christ was mentioned twice in chapter 1. It speaks of the rapture of the church and uh, the judgment seat of Christ afterwards. And Paul said that I'm looking forward to rejoicing in that day of what God has done in you. Uh, he count, calls them the crown of his rejoicing in chapter 4. He was really looking forward to the judgment seat of Christ and seeing all the good that these believers would be rewarded because they would uh, press on with this mindset. Then he gives himself as an example of that lowly mind. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering and a sacrifice in service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. So Paul was glad to pour himself as a drink offering out as a drink offering and to serve them and he was he was glad to do it and rejoice uh, in what God was doing in their lives and then he speaks of Timothy as a second example but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But now you know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that myself shall also come shortly. So he was sending Timothy back to the saints at Philippi, but he wanted to see how his trial was going to come out. And so he was keeping Timothy there until then. Maybe Timothy and Paul could both uh, come together. These are pretty high accolades and a good description of someone, a servant of the Lord that has the mind of Christ. And Paul says, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for you. That's pretty high accolade for young Timothy. Paul's spiritual son. He was selfless. Um, he didn't seek his own interests, but he was uh, proven in character to be a humble servant of the Lord who just wanted to see others helped and brought along in their faith. And then the fourth example is Epaphroditus, and he was originally from Philippi. He's the one that brought the gift to Paul, which was a, the reason for this epistle. He says, yet I consider it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, 
And then he gives four associations with Epaphroditus. My brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Again, a very high um, praise for Epaphroditus. Paul viewed him as a fellow brother and worker, a co-laborer, soldier in the Lord, and one that had ministered to his needs. Since he was longing for you all and was in distress because you had heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him, again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with gladness, and hold such a man in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. Epaphroditus knew that his fellow brethren in Philippi had heard that he was sick. He was concerned that they'd be worrying about him. And uh, Paul was just telling them that uh, he was sick near unto death. He was serving the Lord selflessly, but the Lord spared his life. And uh, Paul was greatly rejoicing in that. He didn't want to have sorrow upon so sorrow. So he was sending Epaphroditus back to them and uh, telling them to receive him with gladness. He had delivered the gift. He had done the good work. He had served Paul. And now he was commending him back to the church at Philippi to, to again serve there. It says he was close to death and did not regard his life. Again, that's the lowly mind of Christ. The supply, what was lacking uh, in your service towards me is the gift that they sent. Appropriate service, appropriate gift uh, to Paul from the Philippians. So in chapter one, we have the single mind. No matter what the situation, we want to bring Christ into it to magnify him. And that means we rejoice, we choose to rejoice uh, along the way, focusing on what uh, God is doing in the positive sense or what he could do instead of focusing on the negative. That takes the magnifying Christ out of the picture when we do that. And then in chapter two, we want to have this lowly servant mind of Christ. It's a mind that doesn't um, elevate our own personal interests. We don't esteem ourselves above others, but we take that low position and then we take others' interests above our own. And that's exemplified in what Christ did. He left the heights of heaven, became a lowly servant for the suffering of death that um, we might have salvation as in the will of the Father, he finished the work. And so God has now highly exalted him. And so the pattern is this lowly mind, which often leads to suffering, also leads to glory. Suffering precedes glory. It's the same message of Romans chapter 8, same message in 1 Peter 2. And uh, Christ is a beautiful uh, picture of this lowly mind and also uh, the goodness of God and rewarding those who do have that mind. Father, we just pray that we, we would have this lowly mind of Christ. It, it's not that we would be cognizant of, of being low, we just pray that we wouldn't think about ourselves at all, that we would just be, uh, it'd be a joy and delight to serve others without any expectation of anything in return. Just knowing that as we serve the lowly brother and sister in Christ, we're showing our esteem for the Lord Jesus. So Father, help us in these things. Help us to have this, uh, this mindset which brings unity in the meeting, brings one accord. It brings Christ's likeness. This is what we want in our assemblies. We pray that you'd help us in this. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.